Today on Ag Etc, we are at Soil Health U to learn how yield is important but has to be sustainable to work economically. Then Dr. J.P. Michaud heads to the field to identify beneficial insects and harmful insects in your alfalfa and how to decide when you need to treat your crop. Thinking of adding hemp to your rotation? Find out what varieties are best for Kansas. Then we head back out to High Plain Journal's Cattle U to learn how body condition score is important to your cow. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org join to learn more. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. My name is Lance Gunderson. I'm the director of soil health at uh, Ward Laboratories in Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, the focus of my talk today was to introduce and discuss different soil health tests that are now becoming commercially available and have been for a while. Um, most importantly tied to how do farmers use this information uh, when we start talking about soil health. Uh, we hear a lot about nutrient reduction and, and diversity and, and organic carbon and microbes. Um, these are things that conventional soil tests usually don't pay too much attention to. Uh, so the test I'm referring to mostly is, is uh, the Haney test uh, developed by Dr. Rick Haney and his colleagues in Temple, Texas. and uh, wanted to kind of introduce what that test is and some of the things that we go through and things that we measure on that test. So I wanted people to walk away with a general understanding of how the test works. Um, but most importantly, what do we do with these numbers? Uh, focused a lot on, on nitrogen management as one of the biggest players. You know, farmers are, are challenged every day. I always say that I don't ever envy um, you know, producers because they have to be agronomists and soil scientists and economists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, one of the biggest challenges is that, uh, you know, we've been taught that farmers have to do certain things in order to feed the world. And, and there's a common misconception out there that uh, yield is what we dictate and measure success. Uh, and, and it's important to yield. Uh, but it has to be sustainable and economically profitable. If we can't produce, you know, if we can produce 300 bushel corn, but we lose money every time we do it, um, we're not gonna have anybody left to produce corn. And so, you know, the struggle between this is that we have to find a way to not shoot for the moon every time, but shoot for the average, uh, you know, but do so sustainably, and, and when I say sustainable, I mean from an economic standpoint. Sustain yourself economically as a producer. Uh, and, and a lot of the focus on these soil health practices and, and some of the testing I talked about is to try to help producers understand as you build the soil system to make it more resilient to drought or to disease or to weeds and pests that we can eliminate in a lot of cases or reduce in other cases some of the input costs that basically force you to strive for such high yields. So I think, you know, as we move forward, if if we look at the amount of food that's wasted and things like that, that the the goal shouldn't be how can we make everybody produce 300 bushel corn or, or 100 bushel wheat, it's how can we do that and sustain the resource, build the resource more importantly, and uh, make sure that we can continue to do that for years to come. So what I always tell people is that uh, if you farm conventionally, 
uh, meaning that your farm is, is whether that's till or no till, but, but your farm is driven by monocultures and high inputs, um, conventional soil tests are a wonderful tool. Uh, some of these new tests are, are not to necessarily discredit what we've been doing, uh, but, but as we transition into more of a rejuvenative ag system or a soil health system, the new tools become more and more valuable. So initially when we start off, it's important to run both tests side by side. Um, and, and I think what you're gonna see uh, beyond just learning about how the new test looks compared to something you're more familiar with, uh, as you move forward, you're gonna find that, that some of these new tools like the Haney test become more and more valuable to your operation as you progress down the, the road for soil health. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. So here we got an alfalfa field. As you can see on the edge, we're just starting to harvest it here. So that's about as high as they're going to let it get. And uh, we should find a lot of interesting uh, beneficial species in here because apart from wheat, alfalfa is the other wonderful spring crop that hosts all the early generations of our beneficial species that uh, after the alfalfa is cut, many of them will leave and again uh, enter the other summer crops where they help us with biological control of different pests. So let's see what kind of insect diversity we can find here. Oh my goodness. So look at that. So, <laughs> wow. so okay, everybody that's taken off there, you can see the nabid bugs. Lots of lady beetles, mostly hippodamia and some CMAC. But what we've got is basically a half a cup of pea aphids. <laughs> look at the pea aphids. Oh, wow. And you see, you look at this crop, and it probably has taken some vigor out of the crop, all these aphids. But, you know, oh, and look, there's a tarnished plant bug. That's another pest. Unfortunately, we got to take the good with the bad. And one of the things alfalfa does is produce a lot of tarnished plant bug. And they are a pest and uh, they will damage ripening grain uh, sorghum for example and so yeah we'd expect to find some tarnished plant bug but look at all these aphids that's actually quite a heavy population of pea aphids and there actually are several other species of aphids in alfalfa so you've got some cowpea aphids which would be the dark ones we don't see any there's a tiny little surfeit fly so again the larvae of the surfeits the hover flies are going to be feeding on the aphids as well but you see how big and fat those pea aphids get. So, you know, that's like, these are like the biggest, juiciest aphids for, that coccinellids ever get to eat. Um, okay, I got, I got some cow pea aphids, so those are the black ones. And so there's also, some usually, and maybe later in the summer we'll have some, is uh, spotted alfalfa aphid as well. So again, three species of aphids normally um, in, the, in the alfalfa, and that makes it wonderful uh, nursery for our natural enemies as long as they're not so many that they're really damaging the crop so that's a surprising number of aphids let's see what it's like over here so let's see another 10 sweeps so there's a big there's our largest lady beetle there which is 
C7, Coccinella septima, the seven spot. Not a native species, but it likes alfalfa and it likes uh, wheat and it contributes to biocontrol. Lots of Hippodamia convergens, our most abundant species. With some small fly species. Another Coleomegala. A couple more damsel bugs. And finally, this is what we were looking for. The green lacewing. Go to that PDF. Beautiful little fella. So that's Chrysoperla carnea with the golden eyes. And again, these guys have voracious larvae that do very well eating aphids. And they don't just eat aphids, they'll eat a lot of other soft-bodied insects. But my goodness, we grew some pea aphids in this field, didn't we? So what are we not seeing that we would expect to see? Oh, wait, we found it. The alfalfa weevil, of course, is what I was looking for. So the alfalfa weevil is, is really the primary pest. And that is the reason this crop will be sprayed. And it probably was sprayed, which is why we don't find very many. We found one in 20 sweeps. Now, if there were a problem, there'd be one in every single sweep or more. Plus it was an adult. If there was defoliation going on right now, it would be the larvae. And so they can be so bad that the whole field will turn a silvery gray. And so that's the main pest here is the alfalfa weevil and they will spray for that. And they probably did. And that's one of the reasons they may have so many aphids as well, because when they're spraying, unless they use a very selective material, they're going to kill a lot of the natural enemies. So then they have to come back in. And in that time, boy, those aphids could really get a head start. So that's my best guess of what's going on here is to begin with the cold weather really slowed down the natural enemies more than the aphids. Then we probably had a treatment for alfalfa weevil that killed the natural, earlier natural enemies and so they had to recolonize. And in that time, the, uh, the aphids got a little heavy. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP. That brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. So a couple of weeks later from the last time we were out in alfalfa, different field of course. Uh, so this one as you can see is ready to be cut. Uh, it's flowering and last time we were out we found a tremendous uh, amount of pea aphids uh, but not so many alfalfa weevils and the interesting thing with all the coccinellids that we found eating those pea aphids were in fact they were all adults we did not find any larvae so that suggests to me that that field had been sprayed with uh, insecticide for the weevils they had killed a large number of the natural enemies which allowed the aphids to take off and then more natural enemies were recruited. And so the very fact that there were no immature stages in there tells me that those lady beetles had not yet had a chance to reproduce. So let's see what we see here. So there's an alfalfa weevil. So this is the pest of the, that really is the key pest. 
So that's an adult. So we've got quite a few uh, hippodamia. We do have some P. aphids. But as you can see, not nearly as many as we were seeing in other, other field. Some aureus. And the aureus will be more numerous here because of the flowers, in fact. And a few P. aphids and a few late instar alfalfa weevil larvae. And a big blister beetle. Now the blister beetle I'm going to talk about because it's a real problem in alfalfa. It's what we call an indirect pest. So this is a gray one. We have three common species here. And the striped one is actually the most toxic. So the problem with the, those guys is they can form quite large aggregations and they have cantharidin in their hemolymph, which makes them highly toxic to horses. And so of course, alfalfa hay, a big concern is you want to feed it to horses, you don't want any blister beetles in it. And it's very, it's virtually impossible to guarantee your hay is free of these things. But when you do observe these aggregations, they can be thousands of them on the plants. The, what, the best advice for the farmer is just stay out of the field. They will disperse naturally in a few days. Problem being, you run over with them with a the tractor, you squish them into the hay, and you've got a problem. You've got your hay contaminated with cantharidin. So here, the very fact that we see quite a few adult weevils suggests to me and much fewer aphids is consistent with a scenario in which that other's field had been sprayed for the weevils, and here it has not. And so we have a really large diversity of insects here. Of course, part of that is due to the, the crop being in bloom. Um, so let's see what we get in another 10 sweeps here. Look at them all. And of course, damsel bugs. There's a, a seven spot lady beetle, some more tarnished plant bugs. And, in the, and of course, uh, different stages of the alfalfa weevil. So we have three species of coccinellids. Um, what else? So again, I would say the farmer here probably made a wise decision in not spraying. As you can see, he's got a lot of hay here. It's a low-lying field, so it's a lot of good moisture. Uh, and there's quite a few weevils in here. And yet you don't see a lot of damage on the plants. You don't see a lot of loss of defoliation. So it wasn't a threshold number or you would see a lot more damage in the, to the foliage. So probably made a wise decision in not spraying. And you can see in terms of the P. aphids, there's not nearly as many as we saw in that other field. Not nearly as many. Quite a variety of spiders. And that's always a good sign. Um, when you have a variety of different spiders, it's a sign that you have a healthy ecosystem because there are such generalist predators. Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Lyons from Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center here in Manhattan, Kansas. Daryl was one of our patients that we did about seven months ago. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there's a way to get rid of this pain, then I then I want to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not gonna go out and take trees with a shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. Well, it's been very gratifying to help people with their painful joints and other uh, entities and it's been especially gratifying to be able to help people who I know and have worked with and known for many years. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Here at the John C. Perry Horticulture Center, we're in year number one for our industrial hemp research. These varieties were all planted, uh, seed from, we acquired from around the country, part of the, the USDA multi-state industrial hemp project. This particular variety, we have planted six different times throughout this plot, and every single one of them looks head and shoulders above all the others. So this is obviously a, a good variety for producing for grain, fiber, or you can produce both 
which is called a dual purpose production. For farmers in Kansas, it's probably going to be working into like a, a into your typical rotation. Um, it's going to be a, a, an alternative crop to work in with your with your corn or with your wheat. We're here in a high tunnel right now, where we are specifically looking at uh, some cannabis varieties that would be used for CBD oil extraction. Uh, we're looking at about seven different varieties. These are all clonally propagated from cuttings. They're not seed origin. The CBD oil is produced in the female flower buds. And the plant is putting all of its energy into producing those flower buds and producing those oils on those trichomes in the flower bud. And what happens is if it gets pollinated, if you've got male plants in the area and it gets pollinated, the plant immediately says, okay, it's time to produce seed. No more CBD oil, no more THC. We're, we're going to produce seed. So the quantity and quality of the CBD goes way down if your plant gets pollinated. So that's why having a pollen-free zone around your CBD production is really important. This outside plot here is our, our, our counterpart to the high tunnel. Um, we have the same exact varieties, we have the same treatments out here. The whole purpose of this is to test whether or not our insect screen provides any protection for the plants inside the high tunnel. So I've I fully expect these plants out here to be pollinated and produce seed, and we'll be able to compare the percentage of plants out here that produce seed compared to the percentage of plants inside that produce seed. Obviously one of our outside plantings, uh, we've got, these are all CBD varieties, and what we're looking for here is we've got uh, five different varieties in the ground, and we've got some different fertilizer treatments, a, a conventional um, triple 13 water soluble fertilizer, and then we've got a, a nursery grade controlled release fertilizer, and then we've matched the nitrogen content with an organic uh, chicken manure based fertilizer. So we're looking to see if the nitrogen will sustain throughout the growing season, if we can get similar growth as we can with a, a conventional nursery, nursery fertilizer. The uses for industrial hemp are almost limited only by the imagination, but it is a, certainly a, a, an option for Kansas farmers in the future. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas Corn Farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me, let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Uh, good afternoon, my name's uh, Stephen Myers. I'm a consulting beef nutritionist with uh, Purina Animal Nutrition. I uh, live in Edmond, Oklahoma. Today I have responsibility of working with uh, range cattle producers and our dealers and co-ops in portions of Kansas, Colorado, and Oklahoma. Today I had the opportunity of participating in uh, the High Plains Journal Cattle U event, which has just been fantastic. I've enjoyed the entire program and have had the opportunity to uh, share some information with the guests today uh, talking about the importance of body condition score in our cows. So one of the uh, things that I shared with the attendees was first, what is body condition scoring? And uh, we define that as a uh, tool uh, where we can evaluate cows based on a scale of one to nine. And uh, we focused on the importance of really where do we want these cows to be throughout the year and uh, our target body condition score is that of a six at calving time, which would mean uh, these cows have a condition deposited over their ribs, down in their brisket, over their top, and we can see evidence of fat deposition uh, actually at their uh, pin bones. And research indicates that by having these cows in proper body condition, 
that is optimum in terms of reducing postpartum interval and improving the percentage of cows that get bred uh, in a 21, 45, 60 day breeding season. In addition to that, we uh, also uh, seen benefits of just uh, other advantages in terms of calf uh, weaning weight and other production parameters that are associated with having cows in the proper condition at calving. We also focus some talking about the importance of a fairly new concept to the industry called fetal programming. And that really is based on the uh, concept of focusing on nutrition of the dam when baby is in utero. And uh, there's a lot of uh, science that is being uh, learned today in this subject uh, uh, area, but it's uh, something that I think is uh, extremely important and has the potential to be industry changing. So it's been a pleasure for me to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the speaker panel. Thank you. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground and thinking, boy, my shoulders sure hurt. I kept waiting, and it, it didn't get better, and so I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not going to work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. And got down there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes and then injected it in my shoulders, and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about, but I thought it was worth a try, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center, right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun.